Hello guys, how are you all? Welcome back to my channel. So, today we are gonna see, what if Deku is killed by a villain at the age of 9, and met Shinigami, part 1. So before we start, go check out the author of this fanfic, Star Dekiru, link is in the description, also subscribe to our channel, and like this video. So let's begin the video. Izuku Midoriya was to most of the world, quirkless. Anyone who looked at her would see a shorter than average girl with curly dark green hair that reached between her shoulder blades, big shiny green eyes, and a cute and freckled face. Some saw her as a weakling and pathetic for being quirkless, while others saw her as a smart girl that was too innocent and needed protecting, even from her own dangerous dreams. Almost no one believed she could be a hero without a quirk, not her teachers or neighbors, but they didn't matter. The people who mattered, Izuka's mother, her uncle Tashinori, and her only true friend, Katsuki Bakugu, knew the truth Izuka did have a quirk, one she kept hidden since she was nine years old. But it happened in the middle of summer break, not long after Izuka had turned nine. She, desperate for some companionship, trailed behind Katsuki, endearingly called Kakin, while he tried to ditch her for her quirkless nature, all while insulting her and calling her Deku. Had Izuka been a boy, he might have simply beaten her up and left her, but while Kakin didn't care about her gender, others no doubt would, and it could interfere with him becoming number one hero if something like that were to end up on his record. He couldn't exactly use the boys being boys excuse. And so, Izuka dutifully followed Kakin, smiling weakly at his insults with the occasional whimpered complaint of that's mean, Kakin while his other friends laughed at her. Most boys didn't want to play with her because she was a girl, and the girls didn't want to play with her because she was too tomboyish with the way she dressed and acted, and of course neither boys or girls would play with a quirkless girl. The only reason she still tried to be friends with Kakin, aside from her fear of loneliness, was that he'd been her only friend before they learned she was quirkless. But that all changed on that warm summer day. Hacken's roving pack of kids ended up in the woods on the outskirts of Enderward, where they had established a secret base. Izuka had naturally followed, but wasn't allowed into the base itself, which was an abandoned shack, so she just sat on the little bench outside while watching Kakin play fighting with a boy with a force field quirk. The rest of the boys were in the shack, playing on their portable gaming systems, but Kakin preferred practicing his explosion quirk on the only kid that could reasonably defend against it. That's awesome, Kakin. Izuka cheered as Katsuki smashed the force field like glass and sent the other boy rolling backwards in surprise. Shut up Deku. I know I'm awesome. That's why I'll be number one. Katsuki boasted, puffing his chest out proudly. The other boy, wanting to recover his damaged pride by insulting the only person he could, sneered at Izuka. Yeah, Katsuki actually has the ability to become a hero. I bet I could too, but you'd be lucky to even get into our fan clubs. Izuka wilted at the comment and looked down, mumbling I can be a hero if I try really hard. Katsuki rolled his eyes and gestured to the force field boy to put up another barrier so that they could continue practicing. Izuka watched them for a bit more when she suddenly saw a flash of red from the top of one of the trees. She tilted her head in confusion, wondering what she'd seen when the red flashed before her again, but this time she clearly saw it as it had stopped directly on top of Kakin. It was a man wearing a blood red hoodie and a white hockey mask with the mouth holes arranged to look like the teeth of a skull. A large meat cleaver hung from the man's left hip and a smaller butcher's knife hung from his right. Several scalpels were slotted into what looked like a bandolier on his chest and what could only be blood was staining each and every blade on his person. The man had landed right on top of Katsuki, knocking the boy down and putting a knee on his back while he deftly pulled both the boy's hands together behind his back and held them with just one of his own massive hands. What the hell? Get the hell off me you freak. Katsuki demanded. The ho-ho, not a chance boy. You've got a pretty nice quirk, and I want it. But to take it, I'll need your heart. The man grinned, his voice nasally and distorted. No doubt he had some sort of voice changer beneath his mask. Azuka gasped, she knew who this person was. He was Jack of Hearts, a villain that could copy people's quirks if he had flesh-to-flesh -flesh contact with them. The news had reported that he had murdered several people and taken their hearts, which was the only piece of the victims that would work with his quirk after the person had died. The force field boy must have recognized him too, or simply given into terror, as he shrieked villain. At the top of his lungs before fleeing. The boys in the shack peeked out to see what the commotion was, and upon spotting Jack of Hearts, they all screamed and ran too. Katsuki yelled after them, calling them cowards while Jack chuckled, Aw, did all your little friends run away? It's too bad. Sorry Brad, but I've got that blonde smiley freak chasing me, and your quirk is exactly what I need to finally finish him. He said, slowly drawing one of his scalpels and twirling it, making sure Katsuki could see every movement. Best stop. Izuka yelled, surprising both Jack and Katsuki. The little girl ran at Jack, intent on saving her friend, when the villain threw the scalpel at her. 
Izuka screamed as the blade stabbed into her upper arm and the pain suddenly shot through the entire limb. You idiot. Run Deku. Katsuki screamed, now looking even more terrified. Oh, your little girlfriend wants to save you. She's got more of a spine than those others. Tell you what Jack opened his hoodie, revealing his bare and near emaciated chest and dozens of hearts that were sewn to his skin in such a way as to make him look muscular while clothed, once I cut out your heart, I'll take hers and sew it on right next to yours. Don't. She's quirkless. She can't do anything. Katsuki yelled. Izuka was doing her best to stem the tears in her eyes as she pulled out the scalpel. The blade was short and thin and had missed any important blood vessels, so there was no danger of bleeding to death. She looked up at Jack, who was reaching for the butcher's knife. If that hit her, she'd die for sure, but the villain wasn't looking at her, his eyes were filled with a manic desire and fixed on Kakin. Too bad, I guess your heart will be all on its own then. Jack laughed before pulling back the knife for the plunge. Katsuki's eyes shut tight in fear, but Izuka's eyes widened. She wanted to be a hero, but that thought didn't even enter her mind as she launched herself at the villain. She wasn't afraid of being hurt or dying, she wasn't concerned with her dreams or feelings. All she saw before her was the gleam of a knife and the death it held for another person. Her legs moved on their own. Dak recoiled as Izuka slammed into his side and grabbed his arm in both of her small hands and pulled desperately. She had only the strength of a child against an adult, so her pulling was in vain, but she needed to get the knife out of the villain's hands. Thinking quickly, she sank her teeth into the man's hand and bit down as hard as she could. The taste of blood filled her mouth as Jack screamed and the knife fell to the ground beside Kakin's head, allowing him to grab it with his own teeth and chuck it away with a swing of his head. Damn bitch. Jack roared, slamming his arm and Izuka into the ground. The impact made Izuka gasp and release her hold on Jack while Bile crept up her throat to join the blood in her mouth. She rolled onto her front and vomited, but Jack slammed down on her back with his now bleeding hand. Both children were in the same position now, face down on the ground of the woods, Jack holding them down. Itsuki's wrists were trapped in his right hand, while Izuka was simply held down with his left hand on the small of her back. You know, you're a really annoying brat. That blonde prick is hot on my ass, so I don't have time to make this really fun, so here's a little taste of your own friend's quirk. Jack said with a sneer. Both children's eyes widened. E but I thought you needed my heart to use my quirk. Katsuki yelled, hoping to stall the villain long enough for his pursuer to catch up. I only need your heart if you're dead. Since you're alive, skin contact is enough. Let me demonstrate. Jack grinned cruelly beneath his mask, though the look in his eyes portrayed a sadistic pleasure. Wait. Katsuki's yell was cut off by the sound of an explosion and an ear-splitting scream. The boy looked horrified as he saw the flames and smoke of the explosion emanating from Izuka's back. The little girl was in horrendous pain, her entire back felt like every inch of skin had been scorched off to the point that the pain was too intense to even describe. A sickening smell of cooking flesh filled the air and Katsuki wretched as blood and smoke poured from the massive wound on the girl's back. Izuka's scream slowly turned silent as all air was gone from her lungs, leaving her face contorted in a silent cry of pain. She tried to take a breath only for her head to slump to the ground and her eyes to dull. She couldn't breath or feel her thumping heartbeat slowly, all color faded from her vision until only blackness remained. Sound faded next, as Katsuki's cries became quieter until they were silent. The smell of her own cooking flesh grew weaker as all sense of smell left her. The taste of blood and bile on her tongue followed as another sense disappeared. Lastly, the feel of the ground beneath her body and the pain in her back died out, leaving Izuka without sense at all. Only her thoughts remained. I died she thought, feeling oddly calm considering what just happened. She stayed like that for a while, not really able to decide if this new situation was bad or not, on the one hand, she felt no pain, but on the other, she was, well, dead. Her thoughts drifted to Kakin, he's still with the villain. That monster will kill him if help doesn't get there. But she was dead, so what could she do? Her thoughts moved to her mother next, mom will cry she cries when I skin my knee or cut myself, how will she react when she finds out about this? I hope Uncle Tashi looks after her. But she was dead, so what could she do? Her thoughts continued to drift, this time to her father, the man that had abandoned her, and her mother, when it became clear she was quirkless, I wish that man had never met mom. Then she wouldn't have been stuck with a quirkless child, then she wouldn't have to bury her child. I don't know if I hate him. Is this what hate feels like? But she was dead, so what could she do? Uncle Tashinori entered her mind next, Uncle Tashi. I'm sorry I have to leave mom to you. Please take care of her. I hope you heal from that wound. She thought, remembering how only a few months ago, he'd been badly hurt by a villain which had restricted his ability to use his hero form. But she was dead, so what could she do? She didn't want to be dead. She needed to help Kakin. 
She needed to go back to mom. She needed to help Uncle Tashi. She needed to live. It's alive. A deep voice startled Izuka, and suddenly, all her senses returned in a flash. She wasn't in the forest anymore, instead she was floating high above the clouds, the sun bathing the sky in gold. She could smell flowers and hear the call of birds. The clouds beneath her felt like cotton as she passed her hand through them. These can't be real clouds, they are just water. She frowned. It is as real as anything, it is simply another kind of reality. The voice came again, though this time Izuka could see the source. Sitting on a cloud just a few feet away from her was a strange man wrapped in an off-white kimono. His skin was a faded red, and his canine teeth were long and curved, which combined with his terrifying face and long horns, made him look like some kind of oni. In the being's lap was a kusurigama, a short side with a long chain on the end. Hey are you the Shinigami? Izuka asked, remembering the stories about the death god coming to lead the dead to the next life. Indeed I am. I am Lord Shinigami, Keeper of the Gate. The man said, nodding proudly. Keeper of the Gate. Izuka repeated, still too dazed to fully realize the gravity of the situation. Yes. The gate to the beyond. Through the gate lies the path to the Great Wheel, where souls are judged and reincarnated. But fear not, the gate is closed to you. All others must pass through when faced with the Keeper, but you bear the gift of the scales, so only you can decide when to pass through the gate. Lord Shinigami said, his deep voice taking on a sagely tone. Izuka nodded and began mumbling to herself, so I definitely died, but I can't move on unless I choose to. Does this mean I'm stuck here like a ghost? And gift of the scales. It must be some sort of balance of power, but why me, and for what purpose? Perhaps. It would be best if I explained. Shinigami interrupted, his features twisting into what looked like an amused expression, it calls for your gift. Humans are simultaneously the most intelligent and the most foolish in how they interpret and quantify their gifts, for they decided that such a thing as a bone in the toe can declare one as ungifted. Izuka tilted her head, trying to get her head around the death god's strange way of speaking. You're talking about quirks. Wait, so the gift of the scales is my quirk? Shinigami nodded, indeed. Humans have named their gifts quirks. The logic is not lost on me, though I feel the word is unsuitable. Gifts are exactly what they are, abilities bestowed upon the living by the spirits of the world. I will explain, for this is also within your gift. Please do, Shinigami-sensei. The girl smiled, sitting comfortably on the cloud beside the death god and eagerly listening now that she was learning about quirks. Shinigami took a deep breath and began, the world you know is only half of the true world, one side of the coin. The other side, overlapping with yours, is the spirit realm where ghosts, spirits, kami, and yakai reside. We are currently a part of the spirit realm now. When a living being dies, they pass through the gate and are placed upon the wheel, where their soul is directed to where it belongs. Sometimes the soul is stripped clean and reincarnated, other times the soul is destroyed due to immense evil that has rotted it beyond repair, and some souls are left to wander free of the wheel, either due to powerful grudges, desires or some form of unfinished business, which forms a connection that defies the power of the wheel. None can predict the wheel, for it is a force, much like gravity, and we have only just begun to understand its laws. So are gods or kami real? And what does that have to do with quirks? Izuka asked. Patience young one. All will be explained, time and both worlds will cease for, as long as you are in this place. As I said, the spirit realm is inhabited by ghosts, spirits, kami, and yakai. Ghosts are the souls of humans that have failed to be reincarnated or destroyed by the wheel. Spirits are souls that have been judged by the wheel to be worthy of acting, as guardian of a specific piece of the human world, with the size of this piece varying from single objects like ink brushes or knives up to entire continents. Kami are spirits that have been raised even higher and govern aspects of existence. For example, I am Shinigami, and I govern the aspect of death. Lastly, there are yakai, ghosts, and spirits that have grown in power and can now act without direction from the Great Wheel. Essentially, they are rogue spirits that exist in the gap between the spirit world and human world and frequently cause mischief in both. Izuka nodded along, her hands fidgeting like she was trying to write in a notebook that wasn't there. Continuing from there, we get to gifts or quirks. You see, about 200 years ago, a certain spirit somehow regained the memories it held as a human and defied the wheel by latching onto a soul being sent back to Earth for reincarnation. The spirit was absorbed into the blank soul, and the first of the gifted, the luminous baby, was born. Other spirits were used to possess other humans to separate the wayward spirit from the baby and drag it back to the spirit realm, but when the rogue spirit and the one sent after it left the bodies of the humans, the powers they held remained. Not only that, but the spirits that had possessed those humans had grown greatly in power. The bonding of spirit and human had created humans with gifts or quirks, and spirits with immense power. 
Other spirits quickly joined in the craze, creating more gifted humans until the entire population was gifted. Following this, we observed that the gifts had manifested in the DNA of humans, allowing new gifted to be born without ever being connected to a spirit, hence the age of quirks began. Amazing. So humans gained their quirks from these spirits. What about the quirkless though? If spirits want to be powerful, shouldn't it be a race for them to get to a quirkless before others? Izuka asked. And there you have hit upon the crux of why you are here. You see, spirits weren't the only ones to learn this trick, the yakai learned too. Yakai began possessing humans to get the power increase, but their grudges, desires, and connections would corrupt the humans, nearly tripling the chances of them becoming evil. Spirits began hunting and destroying Yakai which led to a war. Humans experienced this as natural disasters as spirits that governed large portions of land used it against the Yakai and many serial killers as Yakai possessed humans murdered anyone they believed was possessed by a spirit. It lasted for seven years and it was a black spot on our history. Azuka paled, that was the Sinner's Seven, wasn't it? A seven-year period with countless disasters and murder rates higher than ever. Almost every religious leader declared it a punishment from God. I guess they weren't far off. Shinigami raised an eyebrow. I'm surprised at such a young one, as you know, the war ended 50 years ago. W well that period is what led to the hero movement in the first place. People were so scared and the emergency services were stretched in, so heroes were born to save people and fight villains others couldn't. Izuka admitted with a small blush. Heroes? Interesting. Regardless, the war only ended when the Kami decided that no one could possess a human. The Wii lacked it accordingly and began stripping power from spirits that continued to do so, and the Yakai quickly forgot about it once they had no war to fight and no spirits to remind them of the ability. Yakai are rather fixated on their grudges and obsessions, so they return to normal with ease. Still, Yakai are not a natural part of the world and need to be dealt with as do rogue spirits that risk another war by ignoring the wheel and the law. This leads us to you and your gift, the gift of the scales. Izuka perked up, I'm guessing I have to deal with Yakai and rogue spirits right? Correct. Your gift was created by several kami, including myself, and bestowed upon you by a guardian spirit after we judged you to be worthy. We believe you are the best one for the job based on your keen mind and heroic spirit. The gift grants you several abilities. One is the key to the gate, a power which will prevent you from passing on without actually wanting to, essentially you can die like any other human, but you have to choose to stay dead. If you don't pass through by the time that your guardian spirit has restored your body to a functioning state, you'll be shot back to your body. The green-haired girl gaped at the death god, as so I can come back to life, as much as I want. Indeed, but that is not the true purpose of your gift, it is simply a way of ensuring you don't fail in your task by dying. The true purpose of your gift is in the other two abilities, Eye of the Spirit and Soul Tether. Eye of the Spirit will allow you to see and hear that which is beyond the sight of humans, enabling you to see spirits and yakai in your world. Soul Tether is the most important ability though, it allows you to bind spirits and yakai to yourself. Your task would be to find spirits and yakai that are causing trouble and either appease them to remove their attachments or destroy them. Once their attachments are removed, you can bind them to yourself, and the next time you die, those spirits bound to you will be returned to the Great Wheel. In addition, any spirit bound to you will provide you with their gifts, though the unwilling will make it a painful experience to use them. Azuka nodded, so my job is to find troublesome spirits, remove their attachments, bind them to me, and then die to send them on. And each spirit I'm bound to will give me a new quirk. Correct, you catch on quickly. When you return to life, I will provide you with a weapon that can end your life quickly and painlessly without injury, so as to make delivering those spirits easier. All that we of the spirit realm ask is for you to do for us what you would do for the humans, become our hero, our symbol of peace. The balance between us all must be maintained, or calamity will befall us all, living and dead. Shinigami explained, looking at Izuka with a mix of hope and apprehension, as if waiting for her to refuse. Izuka merely smiled wide, her chest feeling tight with the pride and happiness she felt. Don't worry Lord Shinigami. I'll do it. I'll be your hero. Shinigami smiled sincerely and reached out one clawed hand to gently pet the girl's head. And now I know we made the right choice. To return to the human world from the spirit realm, simply dive beneath the clouds. You'll appear as a ghost, so simply enter your own body. Your guardian spirit will have healed your body to a sustainable level, but be warned, his healing ability is limited and he will not stop you from being scared. Azuka nodded, okay. But Kakin and I are still being held by Jack of Hearts and I can't fight him. Please, I want to save Kakin. It is fine. Your guardian spirit, an Ekamata named Chika, will allow you to use his gift once you are aware of him. 
His gift is the creation of blue spirit flames, which can protect you from all forms of fire, and the blue fire will make for an effective weapon. Go now, become a hero to both human and spirit. Shinigami ordered, using the blade of his kusurigama to slice open the clouds. Azuka took a deep breath and leapt into the gap between the clouds, determination burning in her green eyes. She felt herself falling towards the earth below, her home city fast approaching, followed by Ender Ward, and then the woods. She slammed down right next to her own corpse, with Kakin frozen with terror on his face and Jack of Hearts grinning madly, both completely still and unmoving. The fall had been painless since she was a spirit now, but the girl still felt a bit silly falling face first into the dirt. Izuka looked at her body and found the massive wound on her back was now mostly healed, leaving only a massive patch of skin missing. Her entire back would be dominated by the scar of the explosion that killed her, but Izuka couldn't bring herself to care. Sitting beside her body was a large cat, about twice the size of a normal house cat with glowing translucent pink fur and two swishing tails that each ended in a ball of blue flame. The cat's eyes were the same sapphire hue as the flames and fixed themselves on Izuka's spirit body. So you return. It is good to finally meet Lady Izuka. I have watched over you since you were very young. My name is Shika, your guardian spirit. I have restored your body as best I can, but I fear it will still be painful when you return. Nekamata spoke, her voice sounding like a younger version of Izuka's mother, Inko Midoriya. Do not fear for the boy. Time stopped the instant you died and will resume when you breathe again. Taika, thank you. I'm going to need to borrow your gift to save him, will you help me? Izuka asked, stretching her hand out to the cat's beard. Chika gave a feline smile and placed her paw on Izuka's palm. Of course my lady. Now that you are aware of your gift, the bond between us will allow you to use my gift. It will be as simple as breathing for you. Chika explained. Izuka smiled warmly, then let's go. She cheered before walking to her physical body and touching it to bond with it and once again return to life. Her enthusiasm and determination was dampened slightly as her senses returned to her body and she felt the roaring pain that engulfed her back. It took all of her willpower not to scream, instead biting her tongue hard enough to draw blood. Even with a quirk now, she was still at a disadvantage against Jack of Hearts, so the element of surprise was all she had. She could hear Kakin crying and screaming at her, begging her to wake up intermingled with rabid cursing at Jack while the villain laughed. Jack had removed his hand from her, so she was no longer being held to the ground. Her plain white t-shirt was stained with blood and badly scorched, with only the collar and hem of the shirt still intact and holding the front of the shirt to her body. The entire back of it was gone, but at least she'd be able to move without the whole thing falling off, she'd never live it down if she had to fight a villain whilst naked from the waist up. Can you hear me? Chika's voice echoed in her mind, spirits bound to you can communicate telepathically, just think of me. I can hear you. We need a plan, someone is chasing Jack so we need to stall him and keep him from killing Kakin. Izuka thought, trying desperately to ignore the pain. Thinking fast, she came up with a plan, she had no idea what other quirks Jack gained from his stolen hearts, but based on his arrival earlier, she guessed he had some kind of rapid movement ability. The first step was to get him away from Kakin to stop him exploding her again. My gift will protect you from the heat and fire of the explosions, but the concussive force can still hurt you. Chika warned. Izuka smiled in her head. Now was the time to put her plan into action. With as much speed as she could muster, Izuka leapt to her feet, startling both Kakin and Jack as she sprang towards the hand holding Kakin down. Feeling the warmth of Chika's flames coming to her hand, she conjured a blue fireball and struck Jack's arm, setting his hoodie sleeve alight and making him recoil in pain. A-G-H-H. -H. Bitch. Why are you alive? The villain growled. He let go of Kakin's arms, giving the boy a chance to slip away and stand beside Izuka run. He commanded, grabbing Izuka and running away from the villain whilst using his free hand to create explosions and propel the two forward. Izuka, mimicking Kitsuki, put her own free hand behind her and created a stream of blue flames to propel her too. That brat said she was quirkless good news boy. I guess you'll get to have her heart as company after all. Right after I rip it out in front of you. Jack roared, activating his rapid movement quirk and catching up with the fleeing children. Hakan. Swing me at him. Izuka ordered. What? The boy yelled back. No time to argue. Just do it. Please. Hakan frowned but obeyed, spinning on his heel and using all his strength to swing the small girl around and back at the villain. Izuka summoned up as much fire as she could and blasted it all at the villain's chest, aiming for the stolen hearts he had sewn to his body. In that instant, Izuka saw dozens of strange black shapes, monochrome people, and even bizarre-looking animals all surrounding Jack. The spirits of his victim she thought, as Jack screamed in pain from the flames. 
One by one, the spirits vanished in bursts of golden light, as the hearts were destroyed by the flames, until only a single spirit, a glowing green sparrow, remained. Izuka stopped the stream of fire, fearing that if she continued, Jack would die. Katsuki and Izuka stood there, a few feet from where Jack crumpled to the floor. The villain's hoodie was a mess of ash and loose fabric, his right arm and chest were covered in blistering red skin from the flames, and every single one of the hearts he had stolen was gone, reduced to ash on the forest floor. Why you fucking bitch it took months to gather all those H hearts. He spat and threw pained whimpers. I'm going to make this hurt. I'm going to make you scream. Hakan pulled Izuka behind him as Jack lunged at them, but the villain never got near them. Instead, he was sent crashing through the trees by a red, white, blue, and yellow blur. It's alright now. Why? Because I am here. All Might. Uncle Tashi. The number one hero turned and grinned down at the two children before his smile faltered at Izuka's tattered state. Kakin, puzzled by Izuka calling this guy Uncle Tashi, was ignored as the man rushed to the girl and gently turned her around, his smile vanishing completely as she looked at the horrid burns on the girl's back. It was only adrenaline and willpower that was keeping the girl conscious through the pain. It was Jack of Hearts. He caught us and used Kakin's cork to hurt me. Izuka quickly explained so that her uncle wouldn't believe it was Kakin who willingly hurt her. But the furious look, All Might turned towards the villain, but he was unconscious against a tree. Since All Might couldn't fight him, he turned back to Izuka and Kitsuki. Young Bakugou, I see you took out the villain's stolen hearts. That was very good. Now let's get you both to a hospital. The police will be along in a moment to arrest the villain. All Might spat the last word like it was poison. The large hero gently lifted Izuka and Kitsuki into his arms, depositing Kitsuki on his shoulders while he cradled Izuka, careful to avoid touching her wounds. Izuka smiled and the gentle embrace and felt her consciousness begin to slip as the adrenaline wore off. You did well my lady Chika said, by destroying those hearts and defeating that villain, the spirits that were held to earth by their grudge against him have been able to return to the wheel on their own. Rest now. Izuka's smile widened and she happily fell asleep. All Might continued to run towards the hospital, keeping quiet and moving as quickly as he dared not wanting to potentially irritate Izuka's injury. As Izuka's quiet breathing settled into purr-like snores, the hero grinned wider. It seems the little lady is quite tuckered out from her ordeal. Young boy, would you kindly fill me in on what happened? If you feel up to it that is. You're Toshinori, right? Kitsuki said, ignoring All Might's question. The pro hero almost tripped in surprise, W what are you talking about? Akigu scowled, I'm not stupid. Deku I mean Izuka, called you Uncle Tashi when you arrived and you called me young Bakugu, even though Izuka called me Kakin. The now exposed Toshinori sighed and nodded, jostling Bakugu in the process, I had hoped that in the excitement you would have missed those slips. I hope you understand why such a thing is a secret and why it must remain such. Itsuki nodded, yeah, I get it. I won't tell anyone. He said, thinking back to his previous meetings with Toshinori Yagi. The man was a childhood friend of Inko Midoriya and had been like a big brother to her. He'd originally been buff, not All Might buff, but Kitsuki guessed it was part of his quirk and had popped up now and again to visit Inko and Izuka, but a few months ago he'd been hurt badly and was left as a near skeletal man with a horrid wound on his side. After that, he'd moved in with the Midoriya family at Inko's insistence. Was it a villain that hurt you and made you all bony and crap? All Might chuckled, indeed it was, though I came out better than the villain. Unfortunately I can only maintain my muscular form for roughly 6 hours a day, but that's more than enough for me to save people. Now, can you tell me what happened? Itsuki obediently reported everything that had happened from the beginning of Jack's attack to All Might's arrival. The hero had been proud when he heard of Izuka's attempt at rescuing the boy, furious at the villain using Kitsuki to hurt her, and immensely happy when Kitsuki spoke of her quirk manifested and he didn't miss the happiness in Kitsuki's voice. As he reported that her quirk was similar to his. All Might looked proudly at his sleeping niece as he reached the edge of Caruso Ward, home of the best hospital in the city, but frowned as he felt Kitsuki's fingers dig into his shoulders. Is everything alright my boy? Are you hiding an injury? All Might asked. No. It's Dekazuka. The boy said, his voice wavering in a way All Might would never have expected from the boy. When my quirk hurt her, I watched her. She didn't pass out. I saw the life left in her eyes. I'm sure of it, for a moment, I'm sure she died. All Might nearly froze, young Bakugou, are you certain? This could change what I say to the doctors. Could you be mistaken? I'm sure. As she screamed and I could smell smoke and burning flesh. Bakugou swallowed the bile creeping up his throat at the memory. There was so much blood and for a moment, Izuka just slumped over and died. The wound on her back wasn't just a bad burn, there was a hole. 
but then suddenly, the wound healed to what it is now, and she sprang up and used that quirk like she'd always known about it. It was like she was a different person, and she wasn't afraid at all. All Might gently repositioned Izuka so she was settled on one arm so that he could use the other to reach up and gently pat Katsuki's head. The boy grumbled a bit but leaned into the touch regardless. Thank you for telling me about this young Bakugou. Katsuki blushed a bit, don't thank me. I was really crappy to Izuka. I treated her badly because she didn't have a quirk, but even before her quirk came out, she was the only one to try and help. All my other friends ran away. If I have to go home before she wakes up, can you tell her I'm sorry? And that I was wrong. Ashinori nodded, I will. I don't approve of how you acted, but it takes courage to admit what you did wrong and apologize, though I recommend telling her yourself, it will mean more. He said, walking through the doors of the hospital. Almost instantly, doctors and nurses were taking the two children, with Azuka being rushed to surgery. While the chief physician quickly examined Katsuki, All Might asked the boy a question. What is it that you were wrong about? Katsuki's face turned tomato red, and he swallowed that she couldn't be a hero if she can do that stuff for me, then she definitely can, but I'll still be number one, so she'll have to settle for number two. The boy yelled, trying to recover his pride. All Might laughed uproariously and gave the boy a thumbs up as the doctors led the child to another room for examination. Once the boy was out of sight, All Might retreated to a bathroom to change back to his civilian form. His smile faded a bit as he pulled out his phone, he needed to call Inko, and if his suspicions about what Katsuki said was correct, then he'd need to call Nezu at UA, an agent necropolis from the government. Three days later. When Izuka finally regained consciousness, she found herself staring down at her own body. She yelped in surprise before the memories of the fight with Jack of Hearts came back to her. Looking around, she saw Chika resting on the pillow beside Izuka's head, and the green bird that had followed Jack was sitting on the IV stand beside Izuka's hospital bed. Um, why am I not in my body? Did I die again? Izuka asked, feeling odd, as she hovered around and took in her surroundings. She was in a private hospital room, and her body was lying on its front so as not to bother her. Izuka's mother was sitting quietly beside Izuka, watching her sleep. It was then that Izuka noticed two important factors, time was still moving, unlike when she died against Jack, and the heart monitor connected to her body was still beeping along, proving she was in fact alive. Taika stretched and looked up, no, you're not dead my lady. When you are on the verge of waking up, you can leave your body and experience life as a spirit for a while. This can be useful to speak with spirits that aren't bound to you, and you can even possess humans. Though you won't be able to control them, it's more like a mutual exchange of emotions. You can do this after dying too if you don't enter your body straight away. Azuka nodded, I see. Um, would you mind just calling me Azuka? It feels weird to be called my lady all the time. Taika looked scandalized, at least, as much as a cat can look scandalized, but that would be terribly disrespectful. I am your guardian spirit and servant. I'd rather we be friends, if you want to Izuka replied, poking her fingers together shyly. She was never good at making friends. If it would please you, I can try. Please don't be upset if I slip though. Chika conceded. The green sparrow tweeted in a way that sounded like laughter, I'd like to be your friend too. It said in a surprisingly masculine voice, you kicked that bastard's ass and freed my sister's soul from him. I owe you a lot. My name is Taka. Azuka giggled, like a hawk. The newly named Taka puffed out his cheeks, I know right. I was called Taka as a human and when I died and my spirit became a yakai, I became a freaking sparrow. It's not fair. But seriously though, you did me a great favor by destroying my sister's stolen heart. What is your story, Taka? Chika asked imperiously. Oh, my story isn't anything special. I died when I was 19 from cancer. Sucks, but I had a good life for as long as it lasted. But the specific type I had runs in my family, so I lingered on earth to watch my 7-year-old sister and see if she got it too. Her quirk was this really cool rapid movement ability that let her nearly teleport short distances, but it caught that bastard Jack's attention. He murdered her and stole her heart, which forced her poor spirit to follow him. Eventually I noticed the other spirits around the bastard warp and change, and the same happened to my Chissa, she wasn't even human anymore by the time you freed her. But still, thanks to you she was able to move on to the next life, and I figured I could either follow her and hope to be reincarnated alongside her, or I could follow you and repay the debt I owe you. Taka explained. Taika looked at Izuka. It seems that Taka's perceived debt has bound him to you in the same way as your quirk. He is of no threat as he is now, but you can force him to move on if you wish. Keeping him would allow you to use his gift, which would be whatever quirk he had in life. I could fly. It was pretty neat, but unlike other quirks that give flight, it was just flight, not like wind manipulation or anything. Taka explained. 
Azuka entered her analysis mumble mode, so he could fly. Makes sense with the similarities to his sister's quirk. Is the flight caused by wing-type mutations or a psychic ability? Perhaps low-level wind or momentum generation from the feet. And, as a yakai he became a bird. Perhaps there's a correlation between a person's quirk and the form they take, as a yakai. Taika is a nekamata that is associated with blue fire in mythology, so it makes sense that a flight quirk would have a bird-based yakai form. Taka turned to Chaika. Does she usually do this? I've observed her for much of her life. Yes, she does this a lot. But at least it means she finds you interesting. Chaika commented with a cat smirk. Lady Azuka, you are correct about the link between a yakai and the gift they bestow. Yakai from before the age of gifts would often give gifts that resemble their own abilities, and humans with gifts that become yakai take forms resembling their gift. Azuka snapped back to normal, I see. I'm going to need to start a yakai analysis series of notebooks, but anyway, Taka. Are you sure you're okay with sticking with me? I can release you anytime you want me to, and I won't be offended or anything. I don't really think you owe me, I was just doing what I needed to to survive. I'm sure. I ain't leaving you till you decide to get rid of me or move on yourself. Taka said, flying over and landing on Izuka's palm, puffing up his chest in the process. Izuka giggled and brought the sparrow to her face and rubbed him against her cheek, okay. Let's work together and help a lot of people. Taka chirped his pleasure while Chika smiled and swished her twin tails happily. Turning back to her mother, Izuka decided that it was going to be hard to explain all this to her mother and Uncle Tashi, but she owed them explanations and probably Kakin too. Looking at the clock, she saw that it was 11 am and decided that it was best to wake up now and save her mother some worry. With that, Izuka floated into her own body while Chika and Taka made themselves scarce to give Izuka privacy, though they couldn't wander more than a kilometer away. When Izuka regained consciousness in her own body, she felt like her head was fuzzy and her back felt tight and sore. Twisting, as slowly as she could, she moved to a seated position as her mother snapped to attention. Izuka. You're awake. I was so worried about you. Are you in any pain? Should I call the doctor? Oh, of course I should. I'll get him, just hold tight. Mom, wait. Izuka said, almost laughing at her mother's extreme worry, I'm okay. It doesn't really hurt anymore, it's just sore. Inko sighed, thank goodness I don't want to worry you dear, but Kitsuki told Tashinori about what happened when that monster hurt you. Your uncle Tashi has called some people to talk to you, and Kitsuki and his parents are here too. Izuka grimaced a bit, she'd hoped to have a little longer to get her story straight, but it seemed that the choice was taken from her. Right, I guess they're all really worried too. I'm really okay mom, so you can tell them I'm awake. I'd rather get this over with. Alright honey, if you're sure Inko replied, not looking very convinced, but the doctor is going to look at you first. She said, as she got up to collect Izuka's guests. The doctor was just finishing her examination, as Izuka's guests came in, there was Uncle Tashi in his civilian form, Kitsuki and his parents, Mitsuki and Maseru, and a strange pair of people that Izuka had never seen before. One was a short white mouse, or bear or dog, in a suit with a scarred eye, while the other was a very gaunt-looking man in a white suit with deep black bags under his drooping eyes. As they entered, the doctor turned to Inko and Tashi. More than 50% of her back will be permanently scarred, but aside from that she has bounced back incredibly well. Thanks to healing quirks and her own hardness, little Izuka will be able to leave today, and she'll only need an anti-infection cream and bandages for a few days until the skin fully heals. The doctor said with a smile as she patted Izuka's head after disconnecting her IV and all the various machines that were no longer needed. Akin winced at the idea of the scar while Linko and Tashi thanked the doctor. Once the doctor left, Tashinori cleared his throat. Right, Izuka, I hate to do this so soon after you've woken up after your ordeal, but young Bakugu told me some worrying things, including that you manifested a quirk. Izuka nodded, I did, but it's kind of a long story. I was hoping to keep most of it secret. It's kind of hard to believe. She said, looking warily at the mouse and the gaunt man. Ah. Please don't worry about these two. This is Principal Nezu, Principal of UA High, and Agent Necropolis, a government man that deals with the registration of certain quirks. Tashinori explained. The gaunt man, Agent Necropolis stepped forward and spoke in a surprisingly upbeat fashion, my quirk and the types of quirks I deal with are the kind that allow a person to resurrect from the dead. My own quirk is called Necropolis, hence my codename, and it allows me to return to life if I die as a result of trauma and also allows me to instantly tell if a person is dead so long as I know their real name. Izuka couldn't help herself, so are there other quirks that allow you to come back to life? The adults looked surprised while Agent Necropolis smiled slightly, so Bakugou's assumption was right, you were killed by Jack of Hearts. 
Inko gave a whimpered cry and almost collapsed, though Mitsuki Bakugu caught her and eased her into a chair. This is some pretty messed up shit to think a little girl like Izuka was murdered and came back. Mitsuki commented with a frown. Izuka tightened her fists, I wasn't the first little girl he killed, nor the youngest. You're correct about that, Chisahedo was seven years old when she was murdered. Necropolis said. But that knowledge is actually not known by the public. It was kept silent on the request of the Hado family, who'd previously lost a son to cancer and didn't want the media to disturb them. So somehow, you not only returned to life after dying, but also obtained knowledge that should have been impossible. Please tell us everything you can, Miss Midoriya. Midoriya nodded and took a deep breath before telling the group everything that had happened from the moment they entered the woods of Enderward to the moment she passed out in All Might's arms and then the brief exchange with Taka when she first woke up. She was careful to omit nothing, though she did leave out the bullying by Kakin and his friends, which made the boy feel guilty. The group's expressions flitted rapidly between fury at Jack, shock, horror, and amazement. At one point, Chika piped up and told Izuka that she could make her bonded yakai visible if she concentrated, though they couldn't be heard or touched, only seen, which she promptly did to show both Chika and Taka to her listeners. When she was done, Necropolis pulled out his notebook. Well, I can confirm that everything she said is accurate. All people that experience a kind of afterlife after dying and before resurrecting report the same scene, the clouds, the golden sky, and the exact description of the Shinigami. I myself have witnessed this scene. So what does this mean? You aren't going to try and take her away are you? Inko asked fearfully, placing herself between the man and her daughter. Of course not. All my office does is keep her true quirk classified, while having the public classification altered to either quirkless or a reflection of some other aspect of their quirk. We also use it to keep track of people with similar quirks that turn to villainy, can't exactly put a villain on death row if they just revive after execution. Speaking of which, Jack of Hearts had been placed on death row himself for the murders of 12 individuals, including 7-year-old Chisahedo. Technically speaking, he was charged with 13 murders, since he did kill Yuizuka. His unlucky 13th, you could say. Necropolis told her. Izuka and Katsuki gulped while the adults looked torn between being surprised and satisfied, the death penalty was exceedingly rare in the modern day and couldn't be used regardless of crime if the criminal was judged to feel remorse. Ashinori nodded grimly, the courts are usually pretty slow with villains since it takes time to tabulate all their crimes and many try and hold up the process in hopes of getting lesser sentences or the statute of limitations running out on certain crimes, but Jack was proud and boastful and happily confessed, even giving explicit details in a joyful voice at his hearing. The judge moved for immediate sentencing and it was granted. Thanks to you, Izuka, that monster won't be able to hurt anyone ever again. Well that's good at least but can maybe find a way to stall his execution for a while. If he dies with a grudge or obsession, he could become a yakai, and I'd rather not deal with him again until I've got more used to this. Izuka said in a shaky voice, the confidence she'd built up beginning to wear out. The Acropolis nodded, I'll do what I can. Speaking of the job you've been given by Shinigami, since it benefits our world too, I'll see about getting you a quirk license to let you use your quirks in public without getting in trouble. Unfortunately, I'm going to need to ask you to write up reports of any yakai or spirit encounters for us, just give them to Tashinori and he'll pass them along to me. The government may also call on you for help if we run into a situation we believe is otherworldly in nature. Inko looked like she wanted to object, but considering the potential dangers facing her daughter, she decided to keep quiet. Tashinori would never let anything bad happen to her Izuka, and if he trusted Necropolis, then so would she. It was at that moment that Masaru Bakugu spoke up. Not to be rude, but why exactly is my family here? If this is supposed to be a secret, why tell us at all? Inko and Mr. Yagi make sense, but why us? He asked. Ah, well you see, it seems your son was able to piece together young Izuka's resurrection ability by himself after witnessing it, which means my office would need to keep tabs on him. With that in mind, we thought it best if Izuka had someone her own age in the know, as it were, so she could confide in them. As for yourself and your wife, it's standard procedure to inform the parents of any underage child of any secrets they've become privy to, both for the sake of disclosure and so that someone can take responsibility in the event of the child being untrustworthy. Necropolis explained. But Suki scowled, so basically you're telling us so that we can be held accountable if our kid spills the beans. Necropolis murked, essentially. Needless to say, everyone in this room will need to sign non-disclosure agreements. Izuka giggled at the exasperated expressions of the Bakugu family, and the cheerful sound seemed to perk them up with Mitsuki ruffling the girl's hair. Well it's fine. After all, you were the only one of my brat's dirtbag friends not to ditch him. Did you know that none of them called the police or anything? They all just ran home. 
little brats. I'm sure they were just really scared. Izuka defended half-heartedly. Mitsuki just smirked and gently hugged her. You are too innocent for this world. How did my brat manage to make friends with a girl like you? Mitsuki growled, shut up you hag. And until that crap went down, we weren't friends. I was an asshole cause she didn't have a quirk. I called her Deku and said mean stuff to her. He admitted, losing a bit of his angry steam as he spoke. He turned to the girl in question and his face became an inscrutable blend of anger, jealousy, and shame. Izuka, I'm only saying this one so listen. I'm sorry for being an asshole. And I was wrong, you can be a hero if you want, and I ain't saying that cause you've got a quirk, but cause you saved my ass, even though I picked on you. But I'm still going to be number one so don't try to beat me. Mitsuki groaned while Masaru bowed apologetically to Inko, who was actually surprisingly okay with Katsuki's confession and subsequent apology. Only you could make an apology sound like you're scolding her. Show some humility you little brat. Mitsuki yelled as he smacked her son on the head through her eyes shone with pride. Izuka smiled so wide she felt her cheeks begin to hurt and happy tears formed in her eyes. Using Taka's power, she floated up not noticing the fluorescent green feathers that appeared in her wake and then vanished again and flew at Kakan, hugging him tightly. The boy stiffened and moved to push her off when he suddenly caught sight of the bandages on her back, exposed by the open back of her hospital gown. That was the wound she got from his quirk after she risked her life to save him. Izuka, quirkless little Deku had literally died for him. Mitsuki couldn't bring himself to push her away and instead returned the hug as gently as he could. The Bakugou family left soon after so that the Midorias could have some time for themselves before heading home and after a short lunch brought in by some friendly nurses, complete with extra servings of ice cream for Izuka, Necropolis also excused himself, leaving just Inko, Izuka, Tashinori, and Nezu. At one point, Tashi and Nezu disappeared for a few minutes only to return with determined expressions. Nezu cleared his throat, now, I was originally called here by Toshinori after he learned of your fire quirk, but since we now know you likely have multiple quirks, my reason for being here has expanded. Essentially, I am offering you an open invitation to come to the US anytime you want to use our facilities to train your quirks in private. If you accept Toshinori's offer and prove yourself worthy, I'll even expand this invitation to a full recommendation to UA when you reach high school. Are really Azuka half screamed, almost jumping with excitement. Of course. Nezu smiled, I think you have the potential to be a fine hero. So does Toshinori, which is why he has an offer for you. Inko looked to Toshinori, the man that had been like an older brother to her for years, Toshi, are you sure? I know we've discussed it, but why now? Why after this whole ordeal? Toshinori stroked his chin, I was waiting to see if Izuka truly had a heroic spirit. I knew she loved heroes and wanted to help people, but all that means nothing if you fold in the face of villains and suffering. Izuka proved herself against Jack, saving young Bakugou and holding off the villain long enough for me to get there. Izuka. Tell me, what went through your mind when you moved to save young Bakugou? What did you think or feel? Izuka, startled by the sudden question, almost hid behind Nezu, I don't know. My body just moved on its own. Ashinori grinned, and that proves you have the spirit of a hero. That makes you worthy to be my successor, the new symbol of peace and the holder of one for all. Izuka listened with rapt attention as Toshinori explained his quirk, one for all, and how it was passed on. It would give her the power of all might and when combined with the gifts of her yakai and her ability to return from the dead, it would make Izuka into the ultimate hero, one that really could save everyone, human, spirit or yakai. After a quick check with Shika that one for all would not interfere with her other quirk, named Spirit Scales by Necropolis earlier, she eagerly accepted. From that moment until it was time for high school entrance exams, Izuka would train her body, use her yakai quirks to help spirits and yakai, and work towards becoming a great hero, all so that the day would come where she shout to both heaven and earth. It's okay now. Why? Because Izuku Midoriya is here. Six years passed following the fateful day where Izuka discovered her true quirk and began life as a hero in training for both humans and spirits. A lot had changed for her and her little family, which had expanded to include the Bakugus and surprisingly, Toshinori's old teacher, Gran Torino, who quickly became like a pseudo-grandfather to both Izuka and Katsuki. Both children had spent a lot of time training with him and All Might, often using the UA facilities. For Kaken, this was an invaluable chance to get a foot in the door at UA and hopefully earn a recommendation from one of the many hero teachers, while also training the limits of his quirk and body. For Izuka, whose yakai partners gave her perfect control of their gifts, she used this to train her body in preparation for one for all, and to practice techniques and combinations with her gifts, while she also learned some martial arts to cover her lack of hand-to-hand -hand combat ability. 
Izuka rigorously followed All Might's training plan and, with help from the UA teachers, was deemed physically fit enough to safely wield one for all by the time she was 13, following four years of training. This gave her two years to fully train with the quirk in preparation for the entrance exam. Her life at school had also improved, though she kept her quirk secret and was still perceived as quirkless by her classmates and teachers. The first day back at school following the incident, Katsuki had angrily yelled at his friends for ditching him without even going for help, loudly proclaiming that Izuka was better without a quirk than all of them with quirks. The teachers had been happy with Katsuki's U-turn in regards to Izuka and had given the girl a little award for her heroism after the story broke that she'd saved Katsuki, though naturally, the public story was just that she fought tooth and nail without a quirk until All Might showed up. The award had been given by Katsuki personally, who gave Izuka one of his very rare genuine and not menacing smiles, which had nearly made Izuka burst into tears as she hugged him tight. Katsuki had changed immensely following the incident, he had walked on eggshells around her at first, insisting on carrying her backpack until at least a month after her back wound had fully healed. He still called her Deku sometimes, but it became an affectionate nickname meant to gently tease her, as opposed to an insult, and God help the poor bastards in her class if they used it, Kakin would almost immediately go feral and almost blow the offending student off the face of the earth. Izuka always managed to rein him in, and the boy would be rewarded with a bright smile for his actions. It felt a bit silly to the rough around the edges boy, but each of those smiles would make him feel like a hero. Of course, despite Katsuki becoming like an overprotective big brother to Izuka, he never gave up his dream to be number one, only conceding that he'd be at least willing to share the spot with Izuka as a hero team, so long as his name got top billing. Outside of school and training, Izuka had gotten a quirk license. Level 2, which authorized her to use her quirk in public and use it to fight petty criminals and save people from disasters if no other help was present. She wasn't allowed to fight villains or get involved with more dangerous situations, and truth be told, she rarely had to use it. Most of Azuka's heroism had been from covering her face and flying into burning buildings and using Chika's fireproof powers to endure the flames while she rescued trapped civilians. The first time had ended poorly, with the ceiling collapsing on her head and killing her, but after a light scolding from the Shinigami to be more careful, she was sent back without even a scar and only a bump on the head and a slight crick in her neck. Since then, she'd been more careful. In addition, Lord Shinigami had kept his promise and showed Azuka how to use her quirk to conjure a special knife that would fade through all solid objects and could be stabbed into her heart to painlessly kill her without injury. She'd used it a few times to deliver spirit she'd helped go to the afterlife. Her efforts with spirits and yakai had been more successful than those with humans. Most of the time she simply had to help a spirit by talking them through their problems or passing along a message to their loved ones, usually by letting the spirit possess her so they could write a note in their own handwriting, but occasionally it was harder. There was one heartbreaking event when Izuka was 11 and she'd been forced to destroy the spirit of a little boy that had gone mad and become a feral yakai while searching for his mother. That had broken her spirit for a few weeks, but Katsuki and her guardian yakai quickly cheered her up. Speaking of guardian yakai, Izuka's little group had doubled from two to four spirits in the six years since Jack of Hearts. The first was Samahada, a yakai taking the form of a glowing blue shark. He'd been a fisherman in life and used his underwater breathing quirk to hunt fish with a harpoon. His death had been right out of Moby Dick, he'd drowned a few years ago after being dragged to the depths by a great white shark, and his grudge against the creature had been so great that not only did he linger on earth, but he'd taken the creature's form as his yakai form. Izuka was only able to clear his grudge by finding the shark, which was actually wanted by the Coast Guard for killing a few civilians and killing it, earning Samahada's respect and causing the shark yakai to choose to stay with Izuka, allowing her to breathe underwater. The second spirit she gained was a unique situation, one for all. It turned out that when you have a quirk that took a part of its wielder's strength when it passed on to another, it also took a portion of their spirit. One for all, wielded by nine people, including Izuka, had amalgamated their passed on spirits into a single, somewhat schizophrenic personality. Taika explained that sometimes spirits were created when the fragments of destroyed spirits fused together until it was strong enough to gain form, and something similar had happened with one for all. He or she it took on the form of a Kyubi, a nine-tailed fox with golden fur, and each tail ending in a small red flame. Deep within each flame was a kanji representing the number of the tail, and when one for all used the voice and personality of a specific wielder, their corresponding tail number would glow blue like Chika's flames. When all the flames were red, one for all acted like a normal fox and was playful and lacked speech. 
Azuka had only been able to identify three of the personalities within the Akai, a young girl that was shy, but determined, herself, a man that was heroic, and often punctuated sentences with English words, all might, and another woman that was proud, optimistic, and extremely cheerful. After telling All Knight about this particular personality, he had been convinced that it was his master and predecessor, Nana Shimura. The other personalities rarely came out, and most of the time, one for all just acted like a normal fox and followed Izuka around like a faithful pet, though the girl could feel a much stronger bond with the Kayubi Yakai compared to her other Yakai partners. It had been a busy six years indeed, but finally, the day of the UA entrance exams had arrived, and Izuka had awoken with a spring in her step. The now 15-year-old girl had grown a lot and had filled out a bit, though she was still slender and had a slight frame, despite her muscles. Her hair was the same length as always, tied back in a ponytail, and she'd dressed in a pale green tracksuit for the exam today. Both she and Kakin had received hero recommendations from All Might and Nezu and were already guaranteed a place in UA's hero department, but they had opted to take the exam anyway, wanting to test themselves. When Izuka left her bedroom, she found her mother bustling about the kitchen while Uncle Tashi sat at the table with Kakin. Her yakai partners were scattered about the apartment, with Shika in her favorite spot by the window, Taka sitting in Kakin's hair, though the boy was oblivious, and Samahata was swimming through the air above Inko, watching the woman cook. As usual, one for all had disappeared, the crafty fox was always present, but hidden even from Izuka, hence why she hadn't met him until she inherited him. Izuka. Good morning dear. Are you all set for today? Inko asked, dishing up the food. Two lunch boxes were packed and wrapped up beside the fridge waiting for the Izuka and Kakin. I'm great. I'm planning on getting some work in before heading to the exam. Izuka smiled, helping her mother bring food to the table. Tashinori smiled his thanks before digging in while Kakin grunted appreciatively and dug in. Did Necropolis deliver anything new? Tashinori nodded. Indeed he did, my girl. I looked through a couple of the reports he dropped off and put the best on top. He said, handing a small stack of folders to Izuka. She ate a few bites and began to look through them, specifically the one her uncle had marked for her. The exam isn't until 2 p.m., so I think you could manage that job with some help from young Bakugu. Hakan grinned, he loved going on yakai hunts, as the few spirits he got to help fight were usually tough but beatable, giving him a challenge. It was more difficult for Izuka, who had to keep Kakin linked to her like a spirit to let them both see and touch the spirits. Great, a warm-up before the test sounds good. I've been itching to blow shit up for days. Inko sighed and lightly bopped Katsuki on the head with a newspaper, language Katsuki. Hey, sorry auntie. The boy apologized. Inko was too much like Izuka for Katsuki to be able to maintain his usual aggression. Damn Midoriya women. Izuka smirked and turned her attention back to the file on top of the pile, it had a few reports and interestingly, a tabloid magazine that was heavily annotated. Surprisingly, tabloids were actually a good way of finding potential yakai locations. Ghost lights lead lost children out of the woods. That means it's a friendly yakai. She commented, handing the magazine to Kakin. Friendly. Damn it, if I can't fight it then why would I be needed? Katsuki asked, giving an annoyed glare at All Might. Hashinori smiled, look at the locations of the incidents. Izuka and Katsuki both leaned over the reports and their eyes widened, the woods of Enderward, the place where it all began. Tashinori nodded as they looked back to him, you've both come so far and today will be your first step onto the path of becoming a hero. I thought it would be a good idea for you both to see how far you've come and reflect on your progress before you advance even further. Izuka smiled and hugged Tashinori. I think it's a good idea. Plus, that place is where Kakin and I became friends again and where I met Chika and Taka. She said happily, releasing a pulse of her quirk to render her yakai visible to the rest of the humans in the room, though they still couldn't be hurt or touched unless she created a soul tether bond. The two yakai meowed chirped their approval while Samahada grinned widely and a distant yip voiced one for all's approval. After that, Inko gave Izuka a big hug and kissed her cheeks, then gave Kakin a hug of encouragement too. Tashinori smiled and promised to watch their exams closely. And with well wishes fresh in their minds, the two left for Enderward, returning to the place their adventures began. Itsuki, leading the way, as always, looked over his shoulder at Izuka, who was rereading the ghost light reports. Give me all the details. He said, punching his palm and causing smoke to appear. Katsuki hadn't changed much from when he was a kid, he was just taller and stronger, however his personality had mellowed out a little bit and he was less violent. Okay, according to what Necropolis wrote in his own report, the spirit in question takes the form of a fireball that gives off heat but doesn't seem to burn. It has only appeared to children that were lost in the woods at night, though it isn't believed to be a nocturnal spirit. No one has been hurt by it and aside from the children it helped, no one has seen it. 
Izuka read aloud. Got anything in your yakai decks? Katsuki smirked. Izuka rolled her eyes and pulled out a little gadget, it was basically a small black laptop the size of a phone and was loaded with a database of myths and legends from around the world. It was actually called her agency link, since it was used to get in contact with Necropolis and his agency at the government, but its resemblance to the old Pokedex from Pokemon had resulted in Katsuki calling it a Yakai Dex. There are a handful of spirits that look possible. Corpse lights are an option. Oh, there's also a Filipino spirit called an alleyway that is said to appear as a fire that doesn't burn, though it says here that they lead people into pits and swamps to die. Izuka frowned. Taikami out, don't believe everything you read. Humans sometimes get it wrong, or this spirit may go against the nature of its kind. Izuka nodded, hoping that was the case. Ender Ward wasn't far from Tadurin Ward where the two teens lived, so they were in the woods before long. The two walked silently along the familiar trail, remembering all the times they'd come here before Jack of Hearts attacked them. They hadn't returned to the area since, but the scars were still seen even after six years. Trees were broken where Jack had been smashed through by all might, and the old shack was cold ash now, as Jack had thrown his burning hoodie at it when Izuka and Katsuki had run away. Izuka smiled with nostalgia as she looked around, but Katsuki wasn't so happy. Izuka passed him as she flitted back and forth, making idle comments about things she recognized from their childhood, but Kakin could only look at the girl's back. Even covered by her tracksuit and the shirt beneath, Katsuki felt like he could see the scar that now marred her otherwise smooth skin. He had nightmares for months after that day, waking up in a cold sweat, with the memory of Izuka's scream ringing in his ears and the smell of burning flesh clinging to his nose. This place may have been a reminder of how far he'd come, but it was also the reminder of his greatest shame, when the quirk he was so proud of had been used to brutally murder the only true friend he'd had. Izuka may be living and breathing, but memories didn't fade so easily. Katsuki was deep in thought when he felt a slight warmth on the back of his neck, Turning, he came face to face with a giant ruby flame, burning away behind him. Izuka, I think I found it. He suddenly yelled, startled by the flame. Izuka ran toward him before putting her hands up, as if the flame was a wild animal, and she was trying to prove she was safe. Izuka quickly formed a soul tether with Katsuki, so he could interact with the yakai properly. Spirit, can you hear us? Can you speak? The flame flickered and warped changing shape. The ball of flame uncurled itself and appeared as a great wolf with flames for fur, ruby red eyes, and red jagged claws, as well as a gleaming red horn sticking out from its forehead, jagged and razor sharp. Children, you speak with spirits. Are you lost? The spirit spoke, his voice deep and carrying a caring tone. Taika leapt down in front of the wolf, this girl, Lady Azuka, is the hero of Yakai. She helps a Yakai that can't move on to the afterlife. She explained. The wolf considered the cat for a moment before nodding, I see. I have been lost for a while and have roamed these woods for the last year. In my homeland, the children would sometimes call me an alawag, and while my other four mares emble one, I rejected the cruel trickery of my kind. I do in death what I did in life and lead the lost back to their homes. Huh, so he is one of those alawag things. Kind of weird he can be a wolf spirit too, and aren't these things Filipino? What's one doing in Japan? Katsuki asked bluntly, speaking more to Chika than the wolf. The wolf is my true form. It was given to me by the Dewada, the guardian spirit of the forest I originally guarded. I took on the form of an alleyway to help guide people. Many lost travelers are more willing to follow a mysterious beacon than a wolf made of flame. Though I admit, making myself visible to the living is difficult. The wolf explained. Azuka nodded along, having taken out her notebook and began rapidly writing down the spirit's every word. Spirit, could I know your name and your story? The wolf nodded, of course. I am Liab. As the young man said, I am Filipino and was a hunter and guide in one of the great forests. One day, a group of children I was guiding from their campsite was attacked by a herd of wild boars that felt we had entered their territory. I fell and was killed by the boars. I lingered as a spirit instead of moving on so I could ensure that the children escaped. Thankfully they did and the Dewada of the forest gave me my current form as a gift. I always loved children, as I was never able to have any of my own, and in death, I was bound to both the forest I guarded and the children I saved. The forest was eventually bulldozed for housing, so I took to following the children I had helped. One by one, they passed away until the last one moved to Japan. She lived in the city until she too passed away. I have no more attachments, but I chose to linger here and help others. I ended up wandering this place without a destination and became lost. I found this forest and remain here to guide people out of it. Izuka smiled and reached up to pet Liab's fiery fur, much to Katsuki's concern. The fire didn't hurt her and instead felt like a soft and fluffy pillow in her hands. 
My flames will never burn a child, nor will they burn those I protect, he said, looking at Katsuki. With a huff, the explosive boy ran his hand over the fire-like fur too, and had to resist the urge to bury his face in it, like Izuka was doing. You know, you look really cool. You've got a regal, but intimidating look. Izuka complimented, hugging the wolf's head, being careful to avoid his horn. It makes me glad to hear you like it. I understand if you need to make me pass on, but I'd rather stay in this world and help protect and guide others. I don't think I'd be able to rest or reincarnate knowing that there are more people I could help. Liab said. Azuka smiled widely, then you can stay with me and help me. I'm going to be a hero for both humans and spirits, so if you lend me your power, I can help more people. She said brightly. Liab gave a wolfish grin, excellent. I'll admit, it's been lonely since the last of those children passed away. They were like my pack. Well we can be your new pack. You can see my other spirit friends, and Kakin over there can see and touch you when I bond with him. Plus I have a big Kayubi around here somewhere, but he likes to hide. Izuka told him, still hugging his head. Itsuki rolled his eyes, hey, Wolfie, what's your quirk? When you bond with Izuka, she'll be able to use it. Izuka gently admonished him for being rude, but Liab just chuckled, my quirk is safe travels. It gives me good luck when traveling and prevents me from getting lost. So long as I keep my destination in mind, I'll always be able to find it. It works for finding people too, though I need to know what they look like. He explained. Uh, not exactly cool, but pretty damn useful. Katsuki commented. Yeah. I'm aiming to be more of a support and rescue hero than one who fights villains, so a power like yours would be amazing. I could find missing people or locate hostages. Izuka added. Taika purred, then it's decided. Liab, you'll be with us from now on. She said. Liab nodded, excellent. What do I need to do? He asked, sitting back on his haunches. Just hold still. This will feel really tingly. Izuka chirped, closing her eyes and putting her hands together, as if in prayer. Her body began to glow with a snowy white aura, and a strange white strand began to emerge from her heart and snake its way through the air towards Liab, where it connected with his own heart. The wolf spirit felt a wonderful warmth envelop him and felt like his entire body was being cradled by the girl before him, before the strand, and Izuka's aura suddenly changed to the same ruby color as Liab's flames and disappeared, completing the bonding process and leaving behind some of the warm feeling. That was rather pleasant. Liab said, not entirely sure how to react. He wanted to feel the full warmth of that process again, does it feel like that often? Yeah, whenever I use your quirk it'll feel the same. It's a nice feeling, isn't it? The girl smiled. The wolf just nodded and nuzzled his face into the girl's shoulder, being mindful of his horn. Tatsuki rolled his eyes, well not that the giant furball is on your team, you can break the bond with me. I don't need to watch all the sappy crap. He said with a grumble. Izuka just rolled her eyes and severed her bond with him, causing him to stop hearing or feeling the yakai, though Izuka kept up the sight since it was easy to do. Hey, why don't we have a picnic here? We can eat the lunch mom packed and then head to the exam. Izuka suggested. Kitsuki grunted his agreement so the two sat on one of the fallen trees to eat while watching the yakai run around and interact with each other. One for all appeared from behind the two at one point and stuck his head between them, then proceeded to fight with Liab to assert his dominance as the real head of Izuka's pack before resting it on Izuka's lap and taking a cat nap, fox nap. He, he's all worked up for the exam. Izuka giggled, petting the fox between bites of food. Hakin had always been bewildered by the fox spirit and its connection to All Might's, now Izuka's, quirk. The fox had never spoken or gone near him while he was bonded with Izuka, so Kakin had never heard his voices or touched him, though Izuka assured him that he didn't feel any different from Chika's fur, and not even Izuka was allowed to touch the tail flames. Are you planning on using him? Katsuki asked with an unusually serious expression. He remembered how often Izuka had broken bones with one for all when she first got it. It had taken her a year to be able to spread its power evenly across her body at 5%, and another year to boost it to 10% passively, and 20% if she pushed her body's limits. The explosive boy didn't really like the strange quirk. I might do it. It's been a while, and I think he gets testy if I wait too long to use him. All Uncle Tashi and the UA teachers told me was that the normal entrance exam involved fighting. If it's a machine, I think it would be okay, but I don't want to use it against people. Izuka replied, offering a cherry tomato to One for All. Unlike her other yakai, One for All seemed to act more like a real fox than a spirit and could interact with the physical world easily when he wanted to, even eating. Chika had theorized it was because he wasn't a naturally born spirit and was actually some sort of hybrid between living thing and spirit. Your uncle is a tight ass when it comes to the exam. I was drilling him all morning and he wouldn't say shit. Katsuki complained, finishing his food. 
Izuka finished soon after, and the two packed up and began to slowly walk out of the woods and head to UA. The prestigious school had its own ward in Mustafa, Izuka's hometown, and was right in the middle of the city, often being called the heart of the city. In the time Izuka and Katsuki had been training there, the two had met a lot of the staff that worked there, including present Mick, recovery girl, primarily to patch up Izuka after one for all training, Cementus, Midnight, and Lunch Rush. The two teens knew there were a lot of others working there, but they'd never met them. Izuka didn't know why, but All Night was really particular about her staying away from someone called Izawa, but the name didn't ring any bells. Then again, if he was a pro hero, she doubted she would know his real name over his hero name. When the teens reached UA, they found the entrance filled with people, mostly parents wishing their children good luck. Kitsuki promptly shot an explosion into the air, startling the crowd and allowing himself and Izuka to get through, though Izuka turned and bowed to the crowd, apologizing for her friend's behavior. That kinda means kakin. Izuka said, only getting a smirk from the boy in response. As the two approached the doors into the school building, they were stopped by a tall boy with glasses and short blue hair, who glared at Kitsuki, you there. What do you think you're doing using your quirk in public like that? And to scare well-wishing parents, it's shameful. Kitsuki growled, "Eh, hey, you got something to say fucker. Such language. Do you really want to be a hero if you aren't going to respect this illustrious institution, then just go home. The UA isn't a place for delinquents. The boy declared, not intimidated at all by Kitsuki's anger. And who the fuck are you? Some pompous prick from an elite middle school I bet. Fuck you, I'll be a hero and kick your ass to the bottom of the rankings. Kitsuki yelled, making small explosions in his palms. Izuka quickly moved between the two boys before a fight could break out, recommendation or not, if Kitsuki beat up an examinee before the exam itself, he'd probably be kicked out. Please Kakin, no more fighting. I'm sorry sir, we didn't mean to cause trouble, Kakin is just really excited. The taller boy looked at Izuka for a moment, and his expression softened, it is fine, we are all a bit on edge, but please keep yourselves under control. I am Tenya Iida from Samei Junior High. He said, offering his hand. Izuka smiled and shook it. Thank you. I'm Izuka Midoriya, and this is my friend, Kitsuki Bakugu. Good luck on the exam today. Iida smiled and bowed his head, thank you, good luck to you, as well. And with that, the boy turned on his heel and marched off, completely forgetting about Kakin who just grumbled about annoying robot boys and Dikas. Izuka rolled her eyes at him before noticing another girl watching them. She was a cute girl with round cheeks and short brown hair. The girl waved at Izuka upon catching her eye, and the two shared a mutual smile at the silliness of the boys before heading into the exam. They were directed to a large auditorium where present Mick was waiting to explain the exam to them in his usual boisterous way. The pro hero caught Izuka's eye as she sat down, giving her a subtle thumbs up and smirking at the still steaming Kitsuki. Present Mick was one of Izuka's favorite UA teachers since he was always cheerful and he ran her favorite radio show. The examination was pretty simple, the applicants would be separated across several different faux cities on the UA campus, with their assigned locations being decided to prevent people from the same schools teaming up on the exam. Once there, they'd have 10 minutes to gather villain points by destroying robots. The robots were labeled 1, 2, and 3, and worth that number of points, with there being a special zero robot that was meant to be avoided. Izuka frowned, this exam seemed a little unfair towards those without combat quirks, especially when villain fights actually made up a minority of hero work. Either the exam had a secret objective or it was just really badly balanced towards combat quirks. Since Izuka and Kitsuki were from the same school, they were for the exam, but before they went their separate ways, Kitsuki pulled her aside. You better beat the rest of these scrubs. Your fire quirk is perfect for this, so don't screw around. He said, which was his version of encouragement. Izuka hugged him, making him blush and grumble before smiling wide, I'll do my best. Be careful though, I might beat you too. She teased, knowing it would fire Katsuki up to no end. The boy predictably grinned maniacally at the challenge and charged off, leaving Izuka to giggle at the boy's antics while making her way to her own test ground. When she got there, she noticed a few familiar faces, namely Iida and the girl with the round cheeks. She was tempted to go and say hello, but both were busy stretching and preparing for the exam, so she left them alone and decided to have a mental conversation with her yakai. Okay, I'm going to need Taka and Chika to help me here, and one for all two if I run into one of those zero pointers. Sorry I won't have anything for you to do, Samahata, Liab. Izuka thought. It's fine, I don't like to fight if I can help it. Liab said, I'll cheer you on instead and help you find your way if you get lost. Without water, all I can do is offer moral support as well. 
Samahata said, though he looked disappointed that he couldn't help fighting, I'll keep an eye out for robots and shout when I see one. My fires will burn bright. We will be the best here, Lady Azuka. Chika grinned, poised like she was about to pounce. Yeah. Let's fly above these guys. Taka added, doing loops in the air. One for all appeared and stretched, growing to a much larger state, similar to when Tashinori enters his hero mode, we will win. Plus ultra. Here Arden All Might's voice. Present Mick's voice suddenly sounded over the crowd, start. Azuka immediately took flight, using Chika's flames like a booster, while Present Mick scolded some of the other competitors for expecting a countdown in the hero world. It didn't take long for Izuka to encounter some villain bots and begin analyzing them, one-pointers were basic robots with twin gatling guns that shot pellets at a low speed, the two-pointers were like four-legged scorpions with a gun for a stinger and armored legs, and the three-pointer resembled a tank with arms and two giant missile pods. The green-haired girl quickly pinpointed their weaknesses with her analytical mind and shot fireballs at them, racking up an easy 30 points within the first few minutes. After that though, the other applicants began crowding the place, and the number of robots thinned. By the 5 minute mark, Izuka had a good score of 52 points, and so she decided to sit back and watch a bit, scouting the quirks of the others. Iida had some sort of super speed quirk based on engine-like protrusions on his calves, while the brown-haired girl had some sort of gravity quirk. Aside from them, she also noticed a blonde boy with a laser beam quirk, a bizarre boy with six arms that were webbed together, and a pair of shoes that walked on their own. Probably some sort of invisibility or camouflage, though the effect was a bit undermined by extremely sparkly shoes the person was wearing. The girl sat on the roof of a building, writing down notes on the weird and wonderful quirk she saw, only stopping to launch the occasional fireball at a robot that was sneaking up on someone or rubble that was about to land on an unsuspecting examinee. She wanted to be a rescue hero after all, so it made sense for Izuka to prefer saving people to fighting robots. It continued like that until the 8 minute mark, when suddenly the whole place began to shake. We have got a big one incoming. Samahata said, swimming back from his scouting mission. It's the zero pointer, and it's massive. Izuka gulped and flew up high so she could see it over the buildings, not that she needed to, as the colossal automaton was smashing down skyscrapers like they were toothpicks. Frowning at the robot, she turned back to the other examinees that were scrambling to find their way back to the entrance, in the hopes of escaping the threat. Unfortunately, the city was labyrinthine in design, and they were quickly panicking as they failed to find their way. Oh no. They're right in the war path of that thing. Liab, follow my lead. Izuka ordered as she flew down to the crowd. Everyone. Follow my red flames to the entrance. She screamed while Liab, now in Alawag form, allowed himself to become visible. The examinees gratefully chased a fireball while Izuka held up the rear to ensure no stragglers when she suddenly heard a noise that made her heart stop. Oh ow. Izuka turned, and the color drained from her face. The gravity girl was stuck under some rubble right in front of the zero pointer, and the machine was fast approaching. The girl kept trying to use her quirk only to fail and begin retching, likely due to overuse. Izuka flew at the girl as fast as she could, blasting Chika's flames from her palms and feet, ruining her shoes in the process. She landed in front of her and smiled, it's okay now. I'm here to help. The brown-haired girl looked up at Izuka, I I can't get this off me, and my quirk won't work. Ah, the gravity nullification quirk, right. Don't worry, I've got it. Izuka said, maintaining her smile, as she relaxed her body. One for all. Full cow 5%. She thought, causing her body to glow with a familiar green and red lightning. Izuka briefly considered punching the rock holding the trapped girl's leg, but was afraid that the rubble would hurt the victim, so she instead pumped one for all into her legs and back before carefully lifting the slab of concrete, allowing the girl to crawl out. The girl turned to thank Izuka, only to scream. Izuka looked up and saw the zero pointer reaching down, ready to crush both her and the girl she rescued. The girl's leg was injured so she couldn't run, and Izuka wasn't confident she could escape fast enough if she carried her, leaving only one option, fight. Pushing full cowl to 10%, Izuka flew into the air and began charging her right arm with as much of Jika's flames as she could, causing her entire arm to be wreathed in blue. Full cowl 10% plus concentrated Nekamata flames equals. Izuka launched her fist forward, striking the zero pointer in the head with her fist, the air pressure of the powerful blow, and the intense flames creating a punch that was like an extremely small and localized nuclear blast. Regula smash. The robot's head crumbled and melted under the extreme force and heat, leaving it headless, as the massive automaton crumpled to the ground with a resounding crash, leaving nothing but molten metal and scrap not even fit for a junkyard. Smiling at her attack, Izuka flexed her fingers to ensure she was fine, finding them a little stiff but otherwise unharmed. 
with a happy sigh, she descended and hit the ground beside the injured girl just as present Mick declared the test over. Azuka sat on the ground beside the girl she'd saved and smiled, phew, heck of a test huh? And we still have the written one next. My name is Azuka Midoriya by the way. She said cheerfully. The other girl nodded, yeah. Thanks so much for helping me. I'm Achako Uraka. I'd be a pancake right now if it weren't for you. Uraka introduced. The gravity girl looked Azuka up and down, a guilty frown on her face. Azuka was barefoot as her shoes and socks were destroyed by her flames, as were the legs of her tracksuit pants, below the knee at least, and the entire right arm of her jacket. She was sweating quite hard but still smiled brilliantly at Uraka. I'm sorry for your clothes and stuff she added guiltily. Azuka's eyes widened and she looked down at herself, as if only just noticing, ah man, those were my All Might sneakers too she groaned, smacking her head in annoyance. I'm sorry Uraka said weakly, feeling even guiltier. Azuka shook her head, don't be sorry. You're worth more than a pair of shoes. She then grinned cheekily, you might even be worth four pairs. Uraka giggled at the joke and the two girls were soon joined by recovery girl, Ieda, and a handful of the other examinees. The recovery girl gave Azuka a proud smile as she quickly looked over her wrist, just a little bit of muscle strain. Relax for the rest of the day and you'll be fine. She said before turning to Uraka, you have a sprained ankle. Nothing too serious, but be careful for a few days. And with that, recovery girl gave a healing smooch to Uraka and went on her way, having already looked at the other examinees. The Ida approached the two next, Miss Midoriya, I owe you thanks, as well. Not only did you save the young lady when the rest of us fled, you created a flame to guide us. You have my sincere thanks and my apologies for not trying to help. A few of the others mirrored Ida's thanks, leaving Izuka a blushing mess. I it's okay. We're all trying to be heroes right. I just did what I thought was right. Eventually the crowd thinned and Lee Ab returned to Izuka, his tail wagging happily at having gotten to help people again. Izuka petted him while Yuraka was distracted. The two girls walked to the changing rooms together, with Yuraka opting to keep her gym clothes on and let Izuka use her civilian clothes and shoes since Izuka hadn't brought a change of clothes. Izuka thanked her profusely and ran off to change, partly out of shyness and partly to hide her back scar. The girls then exchanged phone numbers, Izuka's first female friend. And the two walked to the written test together. The written test was tough, but it was filled with the kind of scenarios Izuka used to dream up for her hero notebooks, so she didn't have too much trouble. And so, after the hour for the written test expired, Izuka stretched and smiled, proud to say she'd done her best and, in her own humble opinion, done pretty well too. Izuka walked with Yuraka, call me Achako. To the UA gates, where they said their farewells. I hope we both get in and are in the same class. There are so many strong people applying, it'd be great to have someone I know with me. Achako said in a bubbly voice. Izuka, usually quite shy, absorbed some of her infectious energy and replied just as happily. I hope so too. I'll wash and return your clothes too, just text me your address. Okay. See you later Izuka. And with that, Achako ran off home with a skip in her step. Izuka was still smiling happily when Kakin finally caught up with her. So, how'd you do? The guys in my group were lame ass posers, bragging about their flashy quirks, but barely doing shit. I got 77 points from smashing those weak boys while they got nothing. He said, both proud at his score and annoyed by the others in his group. Azuka grinned and replied, my group had some awesome people. That Ida boy was in it and this really nice girl named Achako. She gave me her clothes to wear after mine got wrecked when I saved her from a zero pointer. I even got to use my Regula smash. Azuka named most of the moves she used after stars and constellations, having picked up the habit after All Might compared her to a shining star when she was smiling. Itsuki smirked, damn, wish I could have seen that. He tried very hard not to look at Azuka's clothes, Achako was about the same size, though she had a bigger bust and slightly wider hips than Azuka, but the cutesy clothes made the boy think things he'd rather not about the girl who was basically his sister. How many points did you get? 52. I got 30 in the first couple of minutes, but then people kept getting in the way, and I didn't want to burn them, so I stepped back once I got 52. I also got to try using Liab. Had him lead the others to safety while I took on the zero pointer. Kind of destroyed my All Might shoes, though Azuka sheepishly smiled. DCH, typical. Still, I bet you came first in your group. No one in mine got more than 20. The two settled into a comfortable pace, as they walked home, Izuka lived further away, but Kitsuki insisted on walking her home, with Izuka bonding with him again to let him hear her yakai. They all discussed the exams, comparing answers to the written test, and giving detailed reports of what happened in the practical tests. 
Aka got a scolding from Katsuki after he admitted offering Izuka to copy answers from other tests in the written test, though the green sparrow just pecked his nose, leading to a five-minute delay where Kakin tried to make fried chicken out of him. He only stopped when Samahata made a smart-ass comment about Aka, making the explosive boy laugh. Samahata and Kakin were so like in personality it could be strange sometimes. When they finally reached Izuka's apartment, Katsuki raised his fist for their usual fist bump, I'll see you when we get the results of the exam. Call me if you go on any cool yakai hunts. Izuka nodded and bumped his fist. Her yakai then said their own goodbyes, Liab bowed his head politely, Samahata slapped his fin on Katsuki's palm, Chika rubbed against his ankle, Taka pecked his cheek, and one for all was hiding again. Izuka's mother greeted her with a big hug and her favorite meal, Katsudan. Unfortunately Uncle Tashi wouldn't be coming home until after the UA results were sent out, as he had to record each one in his hero form, which was down to two hours a day if he was conservative, and he didn't trust himself not to spill the results to Izuka, which Principal Nezu was against, he wanted her. And Katsuki to experience it the same as everyone else, even if they had recommendations. So Tashinori would be staying with his friend, Detective Namasa Tsukauchi instead. For the week following the exam, Izuka fell into a pretty relaxed routine. She'd go out on walks with her yakai, investigate some of the easier reports sent to her by Necropolis, he was very happy about her adding Liab to the team, since he had such a useful quirk, and occasionally spar with Kakin. She'd even met up with Achako again to return her clothes, and had ended up spending the day together whilst doing their mutual shopping, apparently Achako had to do everything by herself, since she'd moved to an apartment in Musatafu to attend UA, while her parents lived elsewhere. It was nice, and the two got along well, though Izuka felt a little unnatural since she wasn't used to being around people that didn't know about her yakai. Finally, the fateful day arrived, and the UA letters arrived. The Bakugas hosted the Midorias at their home, and Gran Torino and Necropolis came to the little party too. Sadly Tashinori still couldn't come, but he assured Izuka over the phone that with two of the letters, they'd all have more than enough of him. The group all settled down in the Bakugas's living room, with Mitsuki and Masaru on one sofa, Inko and Gran Torino on another, and the teens on the third. Necropolis and the Yakai stood to the side, Izuka made the special effort to bond with all the present adults so they could interact with the Yakai. Katsuki opened his letter first and placed the little hologram emitter on the coffee table. An image of All Might in a cheesy yellow pinstripe suit and standing in front of a gaudy gold backdrop appeared, and the man's booming voice echoed around the room. I am here in hologram form. Yes, it is me. All Might. Here to personally record your exam results. Katsuki Bakugu, you did very well on the written test, scoring 96%, though your answers were a little violent, but you did amazing, as I thought you would. Moving on to your practical results, I have to congratulate you on a shocking 77 points. That score is the best villain point score we've had in years. Naturally you passed. Katsuki smirked proudly, but the recording kept going, but there's more we are a school of heroes. We can't just reward victory in combat, which is why we have a secret score, a rescue point score. For acts of heroism and rescue, you were awarded 30 points for a grand total of 107. The second highest score in US history. The image of All Might cuts away to a video of Katsuki jumping to blow up robots that were attacking weaker examinees, followed by yelling and cursing at them for being stupid. Katsuki looked stupefied by the extra points and the fact he got the second highest score ever. Did that mean he beat All Might's score? No, All Might was probably number one, as he is in everything else. The image cut back to All Might, congratulations, young Bakugu. With a more than passing grade and your recommendation, you are more than welcome at UA. See you in the new term. All Might then leaned in close to the camera, good work my boy. I'm proud of you. He said, this time in his genuine voice, as opposed to the hero stage voice. The hologram then stopped and everyone began congratulating Katsuki, who looked prouder than he'd ever been. Izuka, Inko, and Mitsuki hugged him, and the men ruffled his hair or patted his back. Even the yakai got in on the congratulations, meowing, tweeting, and howling their approval. One for all even finally allowed him to touch his golden fur and said well done, Kakin. In Izuka's voice. Then it came time for Izuka's letter. The hologram started the same, but All Might was more pumped up, unable to contain his pride for his niece and successor. Izuku Midoriya, on the written exam, you scored a wonderful 97%, and your answers were on par with a lot of modern hero analysts. You probably would have gotten a perfect score if you'd had time to complete your final answer. Izuka blushed, she'd written a lot for every answer which had eaten up her time. As for the all-important practical, you scored 52 villain points. A very impressive score, and the average score for our top applicants. 
But you, who wants to be a hero that rescues others, grasp the other side of the test, even if you didn't do it consciously. Heroes do not just fight villains, they are also the beacons of hope that saved others. Let's see how you did there. The series of clips played, and Izuka felt herself blush, as the adults, and Kaken, watched in awe at her actions. The clips showed her casually saving others once she'd stopped hunting robots, her using Liab, though it appeared like she'd just summoned a fireball, to guide the others to safety, and then her saving Achako, and taking down a zero pointer. Inko released a happy sob when she heard her daughter's words, it's okay now. I'm here to help. For your feats of rescue, you were awarded 100 rescue points. Combined with your other score, you earned 152 points, the highest in US history. You and another student, I bet you can guess which, were the only two to ever beat my own score of 100 total points. Izuka almost fainted, and Kaken looked at her with pure shock that she had beaten All Might's score. She was the record holder for the best UA entrance exam score. In another world, Katsuki would have exploded out of anger, but right there, sitting beside his friend, he felt nothing but happiness and a twinge of envy. He was proud of them both, Bully Kaken and Weak Deku had become great heroes in the making. All Might's recording continued, congratulations, Izuku Midoriya. UA will be your hero academia. All Might leaned in like he had with Katsuki's video, you've made me so proud Izuka. Once again, you have totally demolished my expectations. You will be a wonderful hero, he said, a glint of proud tears in his shadowed eyes, and with that, the hologram turned off. The room erupted into the Midori women sobbing from happiness and Kaken smirking while patting her back. Izuka diverted some of the attention to her yakai, without whom she wouldn't have been able to help, and the yakai happily received some of the love and attention, though Samahata felt he didn't do enough for praise. And Liab was a bit unused to the boisterousness of the people around Izuka. That night, they celebrated the teens' great scores while the teens in question laughed and discussed the things they do as heroes, as well as their hero names, costumes, and special moves. Itsuki even tried to get Izuka to use Regula Smash in a spar with him, but considering what the move had done to the Zero Pointer, everyone agreed it would be a bad idea, and the two had decided to create fireworks with their quirks instead. In just a few days' time, the two would be entering the US as students. Izuka could hardly wait. Thanks for watching my video, and make sure to check out the author of this fanfic, link is in the description, see you next time, till then sayonara.